Okay, guys, let me have you guys turn on your cameras. Thank you. Um, good morning, guys. Let me have you turn on your cameras. We're going to begin today's class. Okay, so as I had mentioned to you guys last week, um, today and this week, basically, what we want to do is we want to talk about the rituals and traditions specifically of the Mayan culture, right? So the unit that we are covering for last week, this week, and for the continuing two weeks is delving into God's unique Belizean servant. Um, my deep hope for this unit is that we want to be servant workers and community builders as we understand God's design and specifically through the cultural diversity of our community. Um, the creation, the fall, the redemption, and the restoration, the biblical framework for this unit is, um, is molded around the idea that God created us in his image. We are not perfect because of the fall. Uh, we were perfect before, but when the sin came into the world, that tainted and that tarnished our perfect image that God had intended us for us to be. We are redeemed when we learn and when we understand to tolerate our differences, when we learn to accept each other's differences. We can celebrate those differences. And then our restoration. In the Bible, it says, Jesus said, love one another. He didn't say it in those exact words, but he said that several things. Love is a concept that is brought in the Bible in several different incident, incidents, in instances. Sorry, And he simply said to love. But we have to understand as well that to love is a choice. It's sometimes difficult to love everybody. For everyone, even for myself, it's sometimes difficult to love, especially when I have to love my enemies and you have to love your enemies. It's something difficult to do, but it's something that we we have to reach an understanding and a level of understanding to God and the Bible for us to be able to do that and to love every person that comes our path. So now the unit objectives are here. Last week we talked about languages. Um, this week we want to talk about cultural practices. And then our essential question. So based on what we did last week, what we're doing this week, and what we'll be doing for the following two weeks, then you should be able to understand and to be able to answer what does it mean to be a Belizean? So now with today's lesson, today's October 5th, we want to talk about the traditions um, and rituals that the Mayan culture performed in their time. And the two of them that we want to talk about today is the Mayan marriage. So we're going to talk about marriage in the Mayan culture. What did that look like? What did they do? What did they believe when it came to marriage? And then we're going to talk about the Mayan debt. What did they believe about it? What um, What is the process that they thought would happen after someone had died? And what did they do with the physical body of the person that died? All right. So those are the two things that we want to concentrate on today. So now before we do that, we want to understand what are do or who were the Mayas and what was the Mayan empire? The Mayan Empire was centered in the tropical lowlands of what is now Guatemala and the areas that surround Guatemala. This reached the peak. Um, the Mayan Empire reached its peak of power and influence around the 16th century. So the 16th century that is after the death of Christ. The Mayas excelled at agriculture, at pottery, at hieroglyphic writing, at calendar making and mathematics, and left behind an astonishing amount of impressive agriculture and uh, agriculture, architecture, sorry, and symbolical artwork. 
most of the great stone cities, so most of the Maroons, were abandoned in AD 900. However, and since the 19th century, which is um, more close to our time, scholars have debated what might have been the cause of this dramatic decline. So now what is this saying? That the Mayas were a very powerful empire. They were a very powerful race. They developed and they were very intelligent. They created so many things that for us, it might see, be a little bit impossible to think that they were so smart that they invented so many things that they could construct so many things. But they had their peak and when it means their peak it was their moment where they were most powerful and they had the most um discoveries and creations and things that they had made but after that there was a sudden decline and the, the maya the maya cities the maya ruins were abandoned at some point and up to today it is debated what is what is the reason that the maya out of nowhere might have disappeared or their culture just went downhill, their race just went downhill. Some people think it's because of disease. There was like, like for example, like COVID that wiped out a great portion of, of the Maya um, people. And ev different scholars, different people that are architectures and um, architectures, archaeologists, and different persons that research and study history have different perspectives at what might have happened to the Maya. But up to this day, there is nothing concrete. There is nobody that has reached to that point and says, this is what happened to them that created the downfall. Nobody really knows what happened to these people. Yes, we do have Mayas right now, but it's not... Um, it's not as a how we had it before, where we had them um, taking control of most of the populations in a country, where they had so many Mayan people and so many things that they had. So um, this is one of the great mysteries that nobody knows, and up to today, we don't know. And even though every day people discover new things and they uncover new things, um, it's still unknown for us um, what happened to them at this point after they abandoned the ruins. So, talking about marriage. What is marriage for you? And I want you to think about it. And None of you are married, and I hope none of you are married, or none of you have an imaginary marriage with your girlfriend or your boyfriend. But I want you guys to think about what is marriage for you? What do you think is marriage? Or what do you define as marriage? In your own perspective, I don't want anybody to give me the Google meaning or the Bible meaning for marriage. I want you to tell me what you think is marriage. Take a few, maybe one minute to think about it. And then when I say to send your answers in the chat, everybody sends their answer, right? So what is marriage for you? I want to know, have an idea of what you guys think of marriage. And then we're going to go ahead and see what the Maya's marriage was like. So go ahead and think about it. What is marriage for you? Okay, I have one answer already. It says two people are partners in a personal relationship. Okay. Let me have you guys send your answers. Let me have everybody send your answers. If it's just one sentence or one little phrase, that's fine. I just want to have an idea of what you think is marriage. So go ahead and send your answers. What is marriage for you? It is when two persons join together to live for all of their lives. Okay. You don't know? Okay, that's fine. You haven't thought about marriage? You're still young. Nobody should be thinking about marriage right now. But um, think about your parents' marriage. How do you... Because most people, when when they think about marriage, they want to relate it to, to somebody that they already know. So um, a marriage that they have already have some sort of experience to. Right? If I were to ask toddlers what a marriage is, they would define what their parents' marriage is. And that is how most people 
define certain things through experience. So it says, let me see, it is a promise between two persons. When two people join their lives and have their family, okay, being together and forming a family, the union of two people, when people join to form a couple and expand in population, okay, a sacred, legal, and binding union of two people to journey through adult life as partners, okay, when they are two people are together and have a family, two people who engage in a relationship and their union and the union and the union their love. Partners that love each other and decide to get married to to be together forever. Okay. Thank you very much for sharing, guys. Now let's talk about the Mayan marriage. What did it look like or how did a marriage occur when it came to the Maya culture? So, marriage and definition basically for marriage, it is a social institution that creates a conjugal link between its members, a socially recognized bond, whether by legal authorities or through its use and the customs of the people. So, marriage for different cultures means different things. And for different times and different eras, it does also mean different things. Marriage has also always been a social institution. It is an institution. A family is an institution. A marriage is an institution. It is this social institution then creates a link between its members. And note it says members. It can be two or more persons. Marriage, depending in the culture and depending in the era, it can be marriage between two persons. It can be marriage. Uh, it can be a link between more than two persons. Right? You can have. Um, there are cultures that allow for um, for one for one person to be married to several other persons, or for both persons to be married to several other persons. It all depends. That's why it says between its members, more than two persons can be there. It is a socially recognized bond. Whenever you are married, a marriage is recognized in society as a bond. But this bond could be legal, meaning that you could go to a church and you could get married. You could go to a court and you could get legally married. Or it does not have to be legal. For example, a common law union where two people just decide to live together and to form a family together. That is a form of marriage, all right? And it, like I said, it depends on the customs of the people. So now when looking into the Maya world of the Yucatan, we find that during the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, it was custom for males to marry at the age of 17 or 18 and females to marry at the age of 14 or 15. So this was the custom. Now, what does it mean with the custom? If a male would reach the age of 17 or 18, it is the time for you to get married. That is what that meant. That the age of 17 or 18, that is the age at which a boy would more than likely already be a man in society. And because now you are a man, you have to be married. You have to create a family. You have to get a wife. 17 or 18 for males. But for females, at the age of 14 or 15, you were expected to be married already. Now, what happens if you are 19 and you're not married yet? The, there are several cultures, even up to today, and the Mayas back then thought of it something similar. If you pass a certain age and you are not married, you are never going to get married because nobody will want you. You're too old. In society right now, the, the average age for someone to get married is before they are 25. Before they are 25, society has an expectation that you should be married. Or by then, you should be married. So if you're a woman of 
the year of age 30 and you're not married yet society does not see that as something acceptable you're too old why aren't you married yet why don't you have children yet yes sir um mom is good morning <laughs> good morning i didn't understand you clearly so these were the custom ages 17 and 18 for boys and 14 and 15 for girls so a 17 year old boy could be married to a 14 year old girl and they were expected to be living together and creating a family all right the parents preferred for their sons girls from the same social class or town so this was like an enclosed uh, selection the parents of the boy would decide who their son gets married to they choose the wife right so if you were a mayan boy and you were 17 18 and then your parents said okay you're ready to get married they are gonna choose who you are gonna get married to they were they found a girl that would be decent to them of the same social class they had to be the same level as your family and they had to be from the same town if and only if it was impossible for that to happen then they would choose somebody from a different class or from a different town to marry their son all right so this was one of the things that where the parents decided it's like an arranged marriage as well it was considered petty if the male looked for a companion for himself or for his children so now what is petty anybody can tell me what does petty mean what does the word petty mean or when you feel pity for somebody anybody has an idea Nobody? Nobody knows? What does the word petty mean? Or when you feel pity for somebody? What does the word petty or pity? They're synonymous to each other. It was considered petty for the male. Very good. I see that Tristan have, has it there. If a father, and imagine this, if a father would go by himself and the father would be looking for a wife. So you're in the, in the town and the father is there and he's looking at all of the girls and choosing a girl for his son to marry. That was seen as petty. That was seen as something that would have caused that marriage or that family to seem less important than the other families. What would happen is that a matchmaker would need to come into the picture. A matchmaker would need to come and see the son and then have suitable options for, the, for that son, for the man that is going to get married. So the matchmaker would gather all of these girls that were had had the possibility to be the wife and would ask them questions would see um their status would see how they comport themselves and based on what this matchmaker taught then she would decide whom the son would marry so it was a tradition if it is time for a son to get married the parents of that son had to go to a matchmaker and then the matchmaker would decide who that son would marry right now usually each town only had one matchmaker one professional matchmaker and the matchmaker um had that responsibility that was all that that woman or that man did find the spouse for the son. Anybody has any questions up to now? Uh, 
No, no. Okay. Now, once the matchmaker, so all of the process of finding all of the girls and then choosing the girl, once the matchmaker has selected, then the ceremony and the amount of the jewelry was discussed. Now, what does that mean? The father of the girl had to give some amount for the whole ceremony to happen. And that amount usually consisted of the clothing or other any other items these items which were paid by the father of the groom to the father of the bride as a marriage pledge so the matchmaker has chosen the girl and the girl is going to marry the son but the father of the son had to give some sort of amount of valued items to the girl's father and that was supposed to prove to the girl's father that the son and the family of the son had the capability of taking care of the daughter. The groom's mother um, would prepare the clothing for her future daughter-in-law. So it wasn't like you go to a boutique right now and you can find your wedding dress. No, the mother of the son was the one that made the dress for the marriage for the girl that was going to marry her son. Right now, if the mother sewed pretty or it did not sew pretty, that was another thing. Once the mother in law made the dress, you had to wear that dress. All right, now on the day of the ceremony, they meet at the home of the father of the bride, where the priest pronounces a speech with the details of the marriage covenant. Afterwards, the house was filled with burning essence, and the priest spoke the prayers and gave his blessings to the couple. So this is the actual ceremony itself. On the day that was selected for the bride and the groom to get married, this marriage would happen at the girl's house, at the girl's parents' house. That is where the marriage occurred. They would have a priest that would give his speech, would say all of the things that are needed to be said about the marriage covenant, about what they believed of marriage. After the priest was done with that, they would burn essence in the house. And then after the burning of the essence, the priest would pray and the priest would give the blessing to the groom and the bride. When the ceremony ended, there was a meal that was offered to everyone that attended the wedding. And from that moment, the son-in-law stayed in the home of the bride's parents. And this is important. When they got married, when the boy and the girl, the man and the woman got married, they had to, leave, they had to live in the woman's house. They could not go anywhere else. And the son, the son-in-law, had to work for the parents of the bride for about six or seven years. Now, could you imagine that? You got married to this girl. And boys, you got married to this girl. After you got married, you have to live with your um, mother-in-law and father-in-law. Right? With your suegros. Then, when you're living there, you have to work. For the parents of your wife for six or seven years and it would depend on what the parents of your bride would say the mother-in-law so boys the mother-in-law the mother of the girl had to ensure that her daughter gave food and drink to the young husband as a way of recognizing as a way of showing that they recognize the marriage. So the boy is living in the girl's parents' house. The boy is working for the parents, and they had to do that for six or seven years. And while the boy is living there and working for those parents, the daughter or your wife had to give you food and have to give you drink, um, food or drinks, juice, water, whatever it is, to show, and that was how they showed that you two were married. 
that she has a responsibility with you and that is how they recognize that you are married so your parents a lot the mother and the father of the daughter had no responsibility with you all the responsibility was on the daughter all the parents had to make sure is that the daughter was abiding and completing the responsibility that she had with the son that was now married however if the young groom stopped working during the agreed upon time he could be thrown out of the house so now boys you they are living with the mother and the father of the groom of the wife sorry right so you got married you are living with the wife's parents you are living with your wife but you are living in your wife's parents house you have to work for your pair your wife's parents for depending on how many years you agree on right six or seven if after two years the husband decides he's not gonna work anymore the parents of the wife control you out of the house because you are no longer working for them and you are no longer abiding by what by what you had agreed on although the maya were monogamous divorce among them was a simple thing and occurred frequently now what does this mean that they believe that a man could only be married to one woman and one woman could only be married to one man but they also believed in divorce if you no longer want to be married to this person fine you can leave and that's it you're divorced and it was very simple and it occurred very very frequently there were men who married 10 or 12 times and the same freedom was enjoyed by the women to leave their husbands and remarry so usually now what happens in this case is that the the class the little class where a, a husband has to work for so many years for the parents of the wife that was a main reason as to why several men decided to get divorced and as you can see they got divorced 10 times and they got married again divorce marriage divorce marriage divorce marriage and once and and because it was so easy so easy for the maya to just say i no longer want to be married to you and that's it the priest would come the priest would recognize that both of them want to get divorced or one of them wants to get divorced and that's it divorce happen so if you get married to somebody and after i don't know like two months you decide you don't want to be with this person you could just say i want to get divorced and boom you get divorced and then the, the month after you want to get married you could get married again and then after six months you want to get divorced you could get divorced and you could get married again and that was a cycle that because divorce was so easy and both men and women could do that not only men so if a woman decided that she no longer wants to be with this man she could say i want to be divorced and then she could be chosen from the matchmaker again she could be married to somebody else again and that process could continue and it could be done over and over and over so divorce was not really something that um held back people um, in, in the Mayan culture. The Mayas didn't really believe that if you get married, I have to be with this person for the rest of my life. It was a stage in, in some, some way. You get married, if you don't want to be there anymore, you can get divorced, and then you want to get married again, you can get married again. All right? So then that was um, basically how it was in the Maya marriage. Anybody has any questions? Anybody has any question? No, yes. yes. Is it clear? Can I move on? Do everybody understand? Yes. Okay. So now what I want to move on to is the Maya debt. What you see here is the God of debt that the Maya believed in. So, I'm pretty sure that some of you already have an idea of what the Mayan culture was. And you know that the Mayas had a god for basically everything. There was a god. This was the god that ruled over the underworld for the Mayas. 
Um, and as we move on in what I will be explaining right now, I will explain to you guys who his was, what his name was, and what his purpose was. So now, what do you think happens to us after that? I'm pretty sure that you have thought about it maybe at least once. What do you think happens to us after death? After we die, what happens to us? What do you think happens to us? What do you think happens to us after death? Nothing. So we die and then that's it. We die completely. Different people of different races have different ideas of what they think happens. Some people uh, believe that you could either go to heaven or you could go to hell. Some people believe that there is purgatory. And you have to spend so many years in purgatory. And then after you can go to heaven or hell. Some people believe that you are reincarnated. Um, that after you die... At the same moment that you die, a baby is born. So your spirit or your memories or your whatever just is reincarnated in that baby. All right? And different cultures, different races, different groups of people have different beliefs on what they think that, um, what happens after that. But none of us really know. And I said it, um, let me see. And so nobody really knows you are gonna know until when you die and then when you die you can't tell your best friend oh this is what happens when you die right when you die that is when you know what happens after death and you can't tell anybody what happens um but like i said people have different ideas and different conceptions of what happens to us after we die now the mayas had their own conception the Maya thought of the universe as being represented by a sacred um, yasha or a saiva tree. And I think that you guys know already what that is. I have an image here. But they believe that that the this is a tree. This is a picture of a tree here in Belize. Here in the culture of Belize, they believe in the um in the Ishkabai. And they believe that the Ishkabai is linked to this tree. The tree has beliefs for different cultures and they believe in different things. The Maya believed though that that was related to this tree. Now, how was it related to this tree? The highest branches being the home of noble gods. So the Maya believed that on the top of this tree in the branches, the gods, the noble gods, not just any gods, the noble gods lived at the top of the tree. The base of the tree represented the underworld. So the top of the tree basically was where they believed that the noble gods lived. And then the bottom of the tree is where they believe that these roots connected to the underworld. So this tree um, had two, two portions to it. The gods at the top and the underworld at the bottom. And this is what they believe. All right. Though the way each person lived his or her life was generally understood to influence the destination of their soul after that. It is important to not read too much into this idea as the concept of the afterlife as a reward or punishment is not made explicit in the Maya cosmology. So now what is this saying? Right now, um, in present day, most of us are grown up to believe that, okay, I need to do good things so that I can go into a good place after I die. And then if you do bad things, then you go to hell. That is what toddlers it's just an easy way of um of showing or teaching do good instead of do bad if you do good you're gonna go to heaven if you do bad you're gonna go to hell but the mayas didn't believe in that the mayas didn't believe if i am a good person and i do good deeds i'm gonna go with the gods if i do bad things and i'm a bad person i'm gonna go into the underworld the mayas did not believe in that so however you live your life be it good or bad that had nothing to do with where you would go after you die it 
it was a journey after that. So no matter how you lived your life, if you are a good person or you are a bad person in the Mayan culture, that didn't make a difference in what your destiny was after you died. So now, this realm of the Shibalba was governed by a powerful god known as Apuk, who was also understood to be the personification of death. So when they talk about this god, this god represented death. Anybody that spoke about Apuk knew that they were talking about death. And he was the one that governed over um, the realm of the underworld. So now he was he was one of the most powerful gods, and it's, it's even if you think about Greek methodology, um, methodology, and you think about their gods, they have some some similar to the Mayan gods. They believe in a god of death as well. There was a god that ruled over the underworld, and that is Greek methodology. That is miles away from the Maya method, um, cosmology. But they had so, so many similarities, for example, in this god of death. Now, for example, even though the cenotes, and I, I'm not sure if you know what are cenotes, were believed to be the gateways of the underworld, they were also the main source of water for the Mayas. So now, and a cenote is something like this. The Maya believed that this was the way to go to the underworld. So if you go into this, you would end up in the underworld. But this is where they would get their drinking water from. We have these in Mexico. We have these in Guatemala. I do not think we have them in Belize. But um, if we do, they aren't as large as these ones. But this is one that was in Mexico. I think I took this picture from a Mexico one because it's, it showed it very, very clearly. If you were to fall into one of these and they believe that you would swim through it, you would end up in the underworld. Now, people did try it and I did read up in some places where people believed and they tried swimming under it. But this is like an underwater cave that um, most people don't, don't come out alive of these things because you can get lost under it. You may drown and then... So when they, whenever Amaya would jump into these things and they would try to swim to the underworld and maybe come back because that was the idea that they wanted to prove, most of them did not come out back because they would die. They would drown. There was nowhere that they could get oxygen from to, to breathe. And whenever they did not come out back, then the Maya, that, that just proved the point of the Mayas. He did not come back. That means he got trapped in the underworld. But that was not the case. They were just, they just drowned, right? And they got lost and their bodies got lost. Um, but that was just a concept that the Mayas had. Along with that, animals such as owls and bats and especially jaguars were also closely associated with the night and the underworld and commanded both great respect and devotion. So when Mayas thought about owls, when they thought about bats, and when they thought about jaguars, those were animals that they respected. They would not kill. They would not hurt. So if you were killed by a jaguar, that was, um, what is the correct word? That was a privileged way of dying because you were killed by an animal that represented the underworld. Have you guys seen um, the movie Apocalypse? With the um, it has some some yeah. some ideas of the Mayan culture, but when they showed yeah, the the black jaguar, yes, yes. have you seen the part where they showed the black jaguar and what the um like a puma? Yes, it's it's like a puma, but it's it's a jaguar. Um, but they show they in in that scene they're showing that um how the Maya represented those animals to be related to death. 
And here in, in Belize, we do have a lot of jaguars. In Central America, we do have jaguars in certain um, certain countries. But back then, the Maya, those were sacred animals. You could not kill a jaguar. If you killed a jaguar, that was, that was something that was seen similar to a curse that would that would haunt that person's family or the entire town where they lived in because that animal represented the underworld. So you have owls, you have bats, you have jaguars, and you also have um, the snake. There was no animal better that represent the Maya's conception of life and death better than the snake or as the Mayas called it, Khan. And they had a god that showed that. So, through snakes, um, those snakes were seen as a terrestrial creature who slithered along the ground. They were also re often represented in the Shibalba or soaring through the skies in the form of the great feathered serpent, Kukulkan. And that is the name of that um let me see this slide. So this is what the Mayas thought of him. Um, this is Kukulkan. This, this representation was what the Maya used to specifically show life and death. The snake and the snake person was the animal that most accurately represented for them the conception of life and death. And it's something very why why snakes why couldn't it have been another animal why why a serpent and if we go back and we want to relate this to our christianity why does the why does um satan take the form of a serpent when he tricks adam and eve in in, in genesis why is it a serpent why right now in today um when when people are talking in social medias and um, you have one friend that backstabs the other friend or one friend that talks about bad about the other one. We call them víboras. Es una víbora, all right? When you talk about them, they're calling them snakes. Why do we use the idea of snakes? And it all links back to what cultures thought about them back then. And this, if you guys were to link and you were guys were to um, research on other on other cultures and other cultures beliefs of gods and beliefs of sacred animals this um kukulkan is represented in other cultures as well there are different cultures that use something similar something very similar to this where you have a giant serpent with feathers and this serpent is used to represent the conceptions between life and death In the Mayas now, the Mayas represented this animal in their carvings and in their buildings. And this is a picture um, that was taken from a Maya ruin. Now, this representation is showing the head of this serpent of Kukulkan. And it just shows you guys that um, the Mayas respected this animal because it was an animal that was connected to the underworld and just the word underworld is something that the mayas um fear that concept what if i end up going to the underworld all right so now we have talked about this the maya believe that when people died they would enter the underworld through a cave or through a cenote when kings died they followed the path linked to the cosmic movement of the sun and fell into the underworld. So now this, uh, this idea right here. Let me see, see a message in the chat. So, um, the, the carvings of the snake is vivid in almost all of the ruins. If I go back to talking about Kukulkan, it's not, not necessarily Kukulkan, but several, if not all, of the Maruins at some point, either inside or on the outside of the ruin, represent a snake or have a carving of a snake because the snake was the primary animal that represented life and death for them. 
and it was something that they feared um and again if you go back to the movie um a, a, um I forgot the name but the movie that i was talking about that while ago when you had the maya um the maya person that was bitten by a snake and he cut open his veins it was it was a privileged way of dying they won't go like right now of a snake bites you they go and they suck the venom out of you so that you can live uh, they would leave you to die because that was a privileged way of dying you died at the hands of an animal that represented the underworld um so now when kings died and these were the nobles right when kings died they believed that when a king died his soul or his spirit or whatever would follow the sun so on the day that he died um so on the day that he died then the um the soul or the spirit of the king would follow the sun and then when night would come and the sun would would um would set then when the sun is setting then the spirit or the soul of the king would just fall into the underworld right so as the sun is setting this the king is following it and when it sets then this the king would just fall into the underworld that is what they believed right because they possess supernatural powers so the maya believed that the king was like like a demigod it wasn't really a god but they had powers they had special powers so that's why when they died they would follow the sun and then they would fall into the underworld and then when they fall into the underworld they would be reborn and then they would become a god so that's why they had so many gods as well so when a king died that is what the king becomes a god afterwards he's a king with powers on earth but when he dies he now goes to the sky world and joins the other gods because he is now a god All right so then that was what they thought about um, when it came to death um now i'm just gonna finish this up what time does the, does the class finish 10 45 no is the time already did i pass the time No, miss. It's finished as at ten thirty-five. Okay, and I have ten forty. So what did I? I passed the time. Okay. <laughs> so, um, let me. I will continue talking about this next class. Um, but the activities for Google Classroom very very easy. This week I gave you guys two graphic organizers. Graphic organizers are easy to do. The first activity talks about. Um, I read. Um, you have to give three things. It can either be from today's class or to our next or next class. Three things that as I was explaining or as you read caught your attention. So, for example, if what caught your attention was that the husband has to work for six to seven years for the bride's parents, that was something that caught your attention. That is you, that is what you're going to write in the first little box. And then in the second little box beside it, you're going to write, what do you think about that? Do you think that that is correct? Do you think that they should have moved out? Do you think that they should not marry at that age? What What did you think about that? If you thought about that, um, what I said right now, that a king had powers and the king would die and then the king becomes a god. If that was something that caught your attention, then you're going to write on the box beside it, what do you think about that? So then that is three things. The second activity, and I'm going to explain it more in detail um, next, next class, right? Um, but the second activity is basically to, when it comes to religion, what are things that the Maya religion has and what does Christianity say about that? So it's just two graphic organizers. That's basically what you guys have to do for that one, for those two. So um, I'm going to let you guys leave because I'm sorry that I passed the time. Um, and nobody told me anything. <laughs> but have a great day, guys. And I will see you guys on Thursday, right? You can leave. Bye, miss. Bye. Bye, miss. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Miss. Bye. Ha, ha, ha.
Yes, 